Hello and welcome to another episode of James Chris Science Videos where today we're going to be looking at the ISEB program for the Earth and particularly the Earth in space. So we're going to cover um, seasons, years and days and I'm going to give some examples of um, how to look at questions when involving days, seasons and years. All right, let's begin. Um, the first picture I'm going to show you is the first picture we ever had of the planet Earth taken as a whole. And this was taken on the Apollo 8 mission, which was a mission that went round the moon. And as it came round the moon, they then took a photo of the Earth from the distance. And it was the first one they took, they've taken because they've never been far enough away from the Earth to actually take a full picture. They're always too close. And if you try and take a photo too close, um, you don't get the whole um, planet in. So this is the first image that was released. And it's a really famous image. It's been used loads of times. And there's a couple of things I'd like to point out on this. So one of the reasons that it is so good is that it clearly shows on here the part of the Earth that's at day and the part of the Earth that's at night. So you see the lit up side, the side that's facing the sun, is really bright and then it seems to be cut off in half and the other half being the side that is in shade and that would be at night. So we're going to look at how that happens and how we can have half the world at night and half the world at day and how that changes throughout the day. Now you'll be used to images of the earth that look like this. This particular picture is something called the Apple's Blue Marble. This was the, became their desktop image for quite a while. Um, and it's actually a really hard image to take because to take a picture of the whole Earth, you need to be far enough away to get it into your camera lens. And the further away you go, the less detail you have on your image. And so the images that you use are something called composite images where they'll take hundreds of photos of the Earth and they'll use a computer to put all of them together to create a whole image of the Earth. Um, this also enables us to do a picture that shows everything in daytime because otherwise you'd have to be exactly the position of the sun in order to take that photo. This way we can take photos of areas where when they're in the right position and then add it all together. And so this, this was again a very very famous picture of the earth taken um, from various different satellites. So we're going to use that and we're going to look at that to see what happens for a day and I'm going to talk about two types of day because as astronomers, we use two different versions of what a day is. Now, to help demonstrate this, I've got my globe here. Um, this is going to help me show what a day is. So the first thing to notice is that the Earth rotates. It spins on its axis. As it goes round, part of it will be facing the sun. Let's say this part is facing the sun, and this part here is in the shade. It's at night. And there is a, an interesting couple of things to go with how this rotation happens. The first of all, people think that a 360 degree rotation, that is a rotation going all the way round, takes 24 hours. And this isn't in fact true. This is not true. Um, the Earth actually spins around like this and it takes 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds to do one full 360 degrees rotation. Now that has a name, we call that a sidereal day. A sidereal day is a full 360 degree rotation. Now to explain this I kind of need to stand up a little bit to show this. The Earth is not only spinning but it is also orbiting and moving in the same direction. So if I had the Sun at this point here and if I span and moved around when I get to 360 degrees I'm no longer pointing at the Sun. I'm pointing away from the sun. And if I have to rotate for another degree in order for my hand to point to where the sun is, and that takes that extra four minutes. And that distinguishes between the two types of days. A sidereal day is a 360 degree rotation. A solar day is a 360 degree rotation plus that extra one degree so that the sun is always at its highest point. We call that a solar day. I've put some diagrams here to show this. So this first diagram here, you can see the Earth spinning and you can see the half of the Earth that's lit up and half of the Earth that is in shade. And I've shown in purple the arrows of rotation to show that it's rotating in that direction. And the two different days are shown, if I move the slide on, to this. And you can see how the Earth has orbited and moved and how that solar day it has to rotate more than 360 degrees. And it's a 361, just below one degree rotation. Um, useful, 365 days in a year, 
360 degrees means that it's very close to one degree, it's just under, which gives us that amount of rotation we have per day. So there is our day. Our day is caused by the spinning and rotation of the Earth. Um, night time, we can show, and um, this, this is quite a common mistake that people make. The night time is not linked to the axes. So on this diagram here, I've put an axis in black that goes down the center of the Earth. And when you shade day and night, you notice that the shading does not follow the line of the axes. It actually follow, follows across the top. And, and there's a few facts that that's linked to, and I'm just going to talk to you in a second about this. Um, where you stand on the Earth will dictate how fast you travel. So if I take two little bits of plasticine, I'll put one little bit of plasticine here, and I put one little bit of plasticine up here, and I rotate my Earth. I don't know if you can see it, whether it's really obvious. Oops, that's not going to go through. There it is. You can see that the piece of plasticine at the top has travelled less far than the piece of plasticine in the middle. And so the speed you're travelling on the Earth as it spins is going to be different in different places where you stand. So if you stand right on the equator, you are spinning at a speed of, I've just got to look this up because I, I, I can't always remember it, of 1,669 kilometres per hour, or 1,000 miles per hour. If you're stood there, that's faster than the speed of sound. You are travelling if you stand on the equator. Now, this is really weird. If you stand on the North Pole, you're technically not moving anywhere as you rotate, and so your speed on the North Pole is zero. So as I move down, I go faster and faster and faster. And you'd think that you could feel that, but because everything, including the air and the atmosphere, is spinning as well as the globe, and because we're not accelerating or decelerating, we never notice the difference between how the Earth moves. And a great way of thinking about this is if you sit on an aeroplane, you can feel the takeoff, you can feel the landing, but when you're actually mid-flight, it doesn't feel like you're moving. You can sit on the plane, you can throw a ball up and down, it'll just land in your hand, because everything inside the plane is moving with you. And that's the same as the Earth spins, the atmosphere spins with it, which means you don't notice that rotation. Um, second fact, we're going to have to have some explanation for this in a minute. In the middle of the summer, I don't know if you can see this bit here, as it rotates, the North Pole is in sunlight the whole time. So if I go to the North Pole in midsummer, I have 24 hours of sunlight. In reverse, the South Pole, as it rotates, has 24 hours of darkness. Now that sounds kind of slightly odd because if it's 100% 24 hours, 100% daylight, surely the North Pole would be too hot. And so we're going to have to look at how that works in order to explain the temperature there. And we're going to do that when we do seasons. So that's covered days. Days are spins and a few facts with the spins. Let's move on to years. One year. We've done spinning. One year is a complete orbit of the sun. So imagine the sun's in the middle. It's one complete orbit. And this takes 365 and a quarter days. They're not linked. The days and years are not linked. Now the quarter means, I think you know, that every four years we have to add a year. So a leap year comes from the fact that it takes that time to go round. Now I've included a diagram here. People think that it's a perfect circle. It isn't. It's actually an ellipse shape, which means at some times the Earth is much closer to the Sun than other times. Now, weirdly, this has nothing to do with summer and winter. The difference between um, in the middle where it's closest is called a perihelion, where the Earth is at the closest, um, makes a difference of about 0 0.1 degrees Celsius, as opposed to what's called the aphelion, which is the furthest is away, there isn't much temperature difference. So that doesn't cause summer and winter. Something else does. But we can see, as it goes round, it would spin round. It actually travels faster when it's close to the sun and then slower when it's further away and then faster around. You can see on the diagram that I've put on here, um, it shows where the different stages of the Earth are. Now, amazingly, the speed that the Earth is going to travel that distance is it's going 67,000 miles per hour. So not only are we spinning at the speed above the speed of sound, but we're also orbiting 
at a huge velocity that goes round in order to get round the whole of that orbit in one year. Um, so let's move on to seasons. And seasons are now to do with the tilt of the Earth. And you can see, as it rotates, the, the axis of the planet stays in one direction. The axis always faces um, in that direction. So it has a tilt of 23.5 degrees. So that would be 0 degrees, 23.5 degrees is here. And as it goes round, you can see at the moment, this is, imagine you're the sun, this section of the southern hemisphere has got more of it exposed to the sunlight than the northern hemisphere. So in this point here, the southern hemisphere would be in summer. If I rotated it and changed it, you can see now the northern hemisphere is exposed to the sunlight, whereas the southern hemisphere is less exposed to the sunlight. And that is going to make a huge difference to the temperature of the surface of the Earth. And the temperature difference is going to be made due to the angle that the sunlight, sunlight hits. So if I take using, let's just use this pen for a second, if I took the position of the Earth at different places, you can see the angle that the sunlight hits is going to be at various different angles. And what happens when it hits is the light gets spread out over the surface that it hits. So I've, I've put on the screen uh, two diagrams for you. So near the equator would be if the Earth hits, sorry, the sunlight hits the Earth here. Whereas the UK, I've got it as here. So I've put down a beam of sunlight with a value of 100 lux. And I've just used some simple figures. These aren't real figures. These are just to, to demonstrate where it goes. So if one beam of sunlight hits the Earth, and let's say that beam of sunlight had a width of one meter, and it hits the Earth flat, that beam would take up one meter of space. So you can see the two yellow lines that go across, they are going to show that light hitting. The blue line is the surface of the Earth. And you can see that it's one metre where it starts off and one metre where it hits. So each metre squared of, of area of the Earth has 100 lux hitting it. So we've got 100 lux per metre. Whereas if I put this angle here, you can see the yellow lines are now extended. And so that same amount of sunlight, instead of being concentrated one metre, is now concentrated over two metres. So where here you were receiving 100 lux for every meter you, uh, you had on the surface of the Earth, here you're only receiving 50 lux for each meter. So that will be colder than here. The sunlight is concentrated there. It is more spread out here. If I move that on and go for near the North Pole, so here's the North Pole, so it's a very shallow line. Here you can see that the 100 lux that started off as a beam as one metre, is now spread out over 20 metres. So that same amount of sunlight now on the surface only provides five lux per metre's worth of energy. And that's a very um, much lower amount, which is why it can be daytime the whole time in the North Pole and never get hot, because that sunlight is being so spread out that it's not affecting the ground as much as the same amount of light in the equator due to the angle that it hits. So seasons are all about those angles. Now, I'm going to set up an experiment to show you this and hopefully look at that in a little bit more detail. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to me over in another part of the lab and I'm going to show you this using sand and light bulbs. Our experiment, we're going to have a look at how the sun affects the surface of the Earth if it exposes itself to different angles. So, to the side, I've set up these two trays. I've got two trays of sand. The two trays of sand are going to represent the surface of the Earth. And you can see one is flat and one here is at an angle. So this would represent something like the North Pole in summer, where the Earth at the top of the globe is very flat, and this would represent somewhere like Britain where the angle of the Earth in the middle of the summer hits at this angle. I'm going to use these two lamps as the sun, and I've got regular light bulbs in that are going to generate some heat, and these are going to heat up slowly the sand in the same way as the sun does. So in order to see what's happening, we have got here a temperature probe 
and a remote sensor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place these two sensors into the sand like so. So I'm going to put that into here and just cover it with the sand to represent the surface of the earth like so. And I'm going to do the same for the sensor here. That's on the sand there. So that's now all completely set up. Next stage is to turn the lights on and we'll start generating my sunlight that is hitting onto the sand. What I'm next going to do is use this device here. Now this is a temperature probe. I don't know if you can see it. I'll bring it close up in a second. What this does is it attaches itself to the two sensors and when I ask it to start recording, it starts recording two lines. Now, <laughs> this one hasn't calibrated itself very well, so we'll have to have starting points. But we've got two lines going across, a blue line and a red line. The red line represents this one, the blue line represents this, this one here. So we'll give it 20 minutes. At the end of the 20 minutes, we'll see which one's risen by the most. And we're going to use that as an idea to see which surface heats up the most. And we're going to look at why, and we'll explain why using some PowerPoint. Here we go. Here is the um, two results we set up. So I managed to calibrate them so they start at the same temperature. And you can see that the shallow area has got a temperature of 17.2. Whereas the angled area now has one of about 21.7. I get it's changing slightly, but we'll um, set that up for a minute. But you can Done. see clearly that this one here has a higher temperature than this one here. Okay, let's summarize what we've covered this lesson. So first part of the lesson, we covered days. So we talked about the days being the spin of the Earth, the rotation of the Earth. We talked about the difference between a sidereal day of being 23 hours, 56 minutes, and a solar day, which was where the sun's the highest to the sun's the highest, that takes 24 hours. We talked about that one degree extra spin to make it into a solar day. We talked about years being an orbit of the sun going all the way around and how that took 365 and a quarter days and that you need to put in a year every four years called a leap year in order to make that balance. And the last thing we covered was about how the tilt of the Earth affects the seasons and we talked about how the angle of the surface enables the sunlight to be spread out or concentrated and that causes summer and winter and spring and autumn on the earth. Right let's have a look at a question and you can see the picture I've put on the um, screen there is a picture of the earth with the rotational axis there and I've got north and south and I've shaded day and night and I've put very simple question is x at night and is X in summer or winter? Um, you've got some clues in the diagram to help you. So there is the sunlight pointing in that direction. So hopefully you can answer that. Um, I'll put the answer up in 10 seconds so you can think about it for a second. Okay, so let's look at the answers. So here we go. X is in day because it is in the side of the sunlight. So you can see it's not in the shaded side, it's in the side where the sunlight is facing. So A is in daytime, but A is also in wintertime. Because if you look at the angle of the rotation, the angle of the Earth here, the tilt, you can see the northern hemisphere is angled towards the sun, the southern hem hemisphere is angled away. So that would be in the daytime at wintertime in the southern hemisphere. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe and to like the videos because they help me immensely. Thank you very much. Bye bye.